Merry Christmas. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, everywhere, and welcome to worship with Homer United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Lisa, and here in Homer, we live, work, and worship on the traditional lands of the Sugpiak and Denina peoples, modern ancestors of, of the Ninilchik village tribe. Their ancestors have stewarded this place since time immemorial and are committed to caring for our whole community long into the future. If you are worshiping with us online today, welcome, and please take a moment to like the video to say good morning in the comments and please be sure to let me know if you have any prayer requests and for those of you who are worshiping in person today thank you for being here this is traditionally called low sunday because uh, the faithful remnant is the one who returns on the day after christmas so thank you for being here and thank you for uh, following our safety protocols today is the second day of christmas it's called boxing day in the united kingdom and there are a couple different stories of how that name came about. One story is that on Christmas Day, people are super generous and put lots of donations in the church alms box. And so on the day after Christmas, the churches would open up their alms boxes and distribute those gifts to the poor. It also uh, became a day of charity for uh, houses that had lots of servants, like think Downton Abbey. Servants would have to serve at the, the family's Christmas dinner, and so they wouldn't be home with their own families for Christmas Day. So the second day of Christmas became the day that those uh, big homeowners would give their servants the day off and give them boxes of food that they could take home and then celebrate Christmas a day late with their own families. Today is also the Feast of St. Stephen. It's a day that commemorates the death of the first Christian martyr whose stoning is recorded in the book of Acts. And more cheerfully, the second day of Christmas is when my true love gave to me two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> For many, the second day of Christmas is when those holiday blues start to kick in. The big meal is now just leftovers, the gifts have been opened, the toys have already started to lose some of their shine, and we look around and ask, now what? But today we remember that Christmas is not just a day, it's a season. And the 12 days of Christmas is not just a time that some musical sweetheart received an unreasonable number of birds as gifts. It's a time for us to consider the real work of Christmas. It's a time to practice inviting Jesus to be born into our lives every day. As we center our hearts and minds for worship today, I'd like to invite the Son and family to come forward to light the Advent candles. <clears throat> Unto us a child is born, for us a son has been given. Authority rests on his shoulders, and his name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Today we light all of the candles of the Advent wreath, celebrating hope, peace, joy, love, and Christ himself. Let us pray. Eternal God, from the highest heaven to the lowliest stable, your radiant light shines forth in a tiny baby wrapped in rags. Such humble love astounds us. In Jesus, you have become one with us, that we might become one with you. Open our hearts to joyfully receive his love, that he may be born in us and we in him. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. God of light, you have revealed your very self to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, your one word made flesh, who lived among us, full of grace and truth. Open us to your revelation once again, that in the words of your Holy Scripture, we might know your presence and follow in your light always. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the Gospel. Today's scripture is Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. This is in the New Revised Standard Version. <clears throat> now, every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. When they started to look for him among their relatives and friends, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you with great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what, was, what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and was obedient to them. 
His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Time flies when you're having fun. It's the day after Christmas and Jesus is already 12 years old. It's traditional on these Sundays between Christmas and Epiphany to explore the few stories that we have about Jesus' childhood. Some years we remember the flight to Egypt when Herod went on a rampage and the Holy Family had to flee to Egypt to keep Jesus safe. Some years we reread the story of Anna and Simeon, the prophets in the temple when Jesus was taken to be dedicated. And this year we've heard the only story that we have from Jesus' upper elementary ages, uh, the time that Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. We learn a lot about Mary and Joseph as parents in this scripture, and not that they were careless. We know that it's easy to lose sight of our kids. When our grandkids come to visit, I barely have to blink, and one of them's already up to their waist in the bay, regardless of the time of year. Kids wander off with surprising regularity, so it's not the parenting skills that this story focuses on. Instead, we learn a lot about the faith and the piety of Mary and Joseph. They are on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for Passover. That shows that they were faithful to their Jewish traditions, going to the temple for that holy festival. And not only were they faithful this one time, the scripture tells us that this was their annual tradition. Jesus was being raised faithfully by pious parents. And we might think that people who take their religious obligations so seriously might have been a little bit better at tracking their son. But like I said, kids wander off and on their way home, Mary and Joseph lose Jesus. They don't notice it at first. And again, I don't find this odd because if you've ever been to a crowded family reunion or a neighborhood barbecue, you know how the kids all get together and run around like a pack of puppies and it's hard to keep track of who is who. And I bet traveling in that large group away from Jerusalem was kind of like that with the parents traveling at a more sedate pace and the children running back and forth and playing and finally collapsing at somebody's campfire at night. But then they realized that Jesus was not actually there with their relatives. And so Mary and Joseph immediately hurry back to Jerusalem and search for three days before they find Jesus safely in the temple with the teachers. And we hear him make that deeply theological and Christological statement, I am in my father's house. In this 12-year-old boy, we start to get a glimpse of the man, the prophet, the Messiah that he will grow into. So they collected him and started back home once again, all together this time, probably keeping a little closer eye on him. I always wonder how Mary and Joseph would feel if they knew that 2,000 years later, one of the three stories that we have recorded about Jesus' childhood was the one time that they lost Jesus. That is probably not the story that they would appreciate having recorded for all time. But here we have it. They lost him. It's surprisingly easy to lose Jesus after Christmas. We do it all the time. Today is the day after Christmas, and for some, the holiday blues are already kicking in. Your living room floor might still be covered with wrapping paper or ribbons this morning, or you may have cleaned up and put all the gifts away, leaving the floor underneath your tree looking awfully bare and lonely. The stockings once stuffed now hang limp. The big Christmas dinner is in leftover dishes awaiting the microwave after church today. All that anticipation that has built up over the four weeks of Advent gets spent in a short frenzy of activity, and then we start to wonder, is this it? Is this what we've been waiting for? Now what? And just like that, we've lost Jesus. Christmas can feel like the period at the end of the story of Advent. We've been waiting and watching 
knowing the Messiah is coming. And to us, at this end of history, there aren't a lot of surprises in the story. We know that that baby is going to be born and laid in that manger to those parents and that a group of shepherds is going to be told by those angels. Christmas can feel like the end of a predictable story. But as any parent will tell us, birth is only the beginning. Once that baby is born, the real hard work begins. Our challenge every year is to recognize that Christmas is not the end of the story. Christmas is only the beginning. It's the beginning of a whole new relationship with God. It's a beginning of understanding Jesus in whole new ways. Jesus is not part of the story of Christmas. Christmas is part of the story of Jesus. And that story never ends. Christmas marks not an ending, but, it's a, but a beginning. And it's up to us to carry on the work of Christmas, not just during the 12 days of this Christmas season, but throughout our whole lives. We spend the last four weeks talking about Advent as a spiritual practice. What if we also look at Christmas like a spiritual practice? of every day asking Jesus to be born into our hearts and lives, recognizing the face of the Christ child in all the people we meet, opening our hearts and ears to hear the choir of angels still singing of this good news and receiving the invitation like Mary to have Jesus born within each of us. Today, as we clean up the piles of wrapping paper, Today, as we put away the leftovers and wash dishes. Today, as we heave a sigh of relief that this busy season is drawing to a close. Today, as we feel that tinge of sadness that can come along with the holidays. Today, we remember that the work of Christmas has just begun. African-American theologian Howard Thurman wrote, When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and the princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among all people, and to make music in the heart. This is the real work of Christmas. Not the presents, not the wrapping, not the tree or the lights or the food. The real work of Christmas is to know that once God put on flesh to live among us, and now God dwells within our flesh, ours are the hands of Christ. Ours are the feet of Christ. Ours are the hearts of Christ. The real work of Christmas is to celebrate that God chose to live with us. And our response to that good news is to live lives of joyful obedience. Amen. Sounding
I invite you to stand as you're able for our time of prayer. And again, if you are worshiping with us online, please be sure that you let us know if you have any prayer requests. You can put it in the comments or send us a private message so that we know how to be in prayer with you today. Our prayer is responsive. I will say we celebrate your birth, life, or resurrection, depending on which part of the prayer we're in, and your response will be, come and be born in us, and I will let you know when it's your turn. So let us pray together. Jesus of Bethlehem and Nazareth and Calvary, we celebrate your birth. Come and be born in us. Jesus of the manger and the inn, Jesus of the workshop and the temple, Jesus of the lakeside and the city, Jesus of the fireside and the roadside, we celebrate your life. Come and be born in us. Jesus of Mary and Joseph, Jesus of shepherds and angels, Jesus of children and animals, Jesus of fishermen and priests, Jesus of men and women, Jesus of saints and sinners, we celebrate your resurrection. Come and be born in us. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. I have a couple of very quick announcements today. The first is that the office will be closed this week for a much needed break for me and Peggy. Uh, you can leave a voicemail or send an email. We will be checking in regularly and you know that you can always get a hold of me on my cell phone in case of emergency. Please don't hesitate to reach out, but just know if you drop by, the office is not going to be staffed this week. I also just want to take a second to thank Peggy and encourage you to show her some gratitude because uh, the the week of Christmas is always a busy one with lots of extra services. So Peggy, thank you for all of your work. I really appreciate it. And for all of the volunteers, for Lucy and the whole musical crew, uh, it has been wonderful to see so many people filling our sanctuary and helping lead us in worship. So thank you all. Uh, the second announcement is that after church next week, we will be taking down our Christmas decorations after Epiphany next week. And so if you are able to stay for a little bit after church and help us uh, box up all of our decorations to get the sanctuary reset for the new year, 
and the new season. We would certainly appreciate the help. I do appreciate all of the generosity. We know that we don't just give financially, that we offer our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, and all of those are incredibly generous gifts that you offer to our church and to the community. Um, and thank you for all of that. If you are worshiping here in person and want to make a donation today, there is a donation box in the back of the sanctuary. And if you're worshiping online, you can visit our website down below for our donation button or send a check to the street address that you see on the screen. Thank you all so much for your continued generosity. Let's bow together as we offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Gracious God, we are grateful for generous hearts made joyful by the gift of your Son. For you, O oh God, are generosity itself. Bless these gifts we offer to the benefit of all those in need, and bless our lives in the service of sharing your love with the world. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Will you please stand as you're able for the benediction today? Let the love that shaped heaven and earth be born in us. Let the love that created humanity be born in us. Let the love that overcomes suffering and hatred be born in us. Let the love that forgives and renews be born in us. Let the love that brings the blessing of peace be born in us. And may we share that love with all people near and far 
as we do the work of Christmas today and every day. Amen.